Today, Dr. Kelly Hedgepeth and I are going to be talking about some commonly used vitamins and supplements. And as per our usual format, we'll be talking for about half the time and then taking audience questions. And we also have a few polls in the beginning, so we're going to get some audience interaction here. Uh, thank you for those of you who've already submitted questions as well. So I'm going to start by showing you some slides here. And next week we have Dr. Laura Frain, who's a geriatrician, and she's going to be talking about the aging brain. But today we're going to talk about vitamins and supplements. Uh, and we're going to review the latest research and guidelines. And supplements are one of the biggest industries in this country. There's over 30 billion spent in this country every year on supplements and vitamins. And over half of adults in this country use some type of supplement or vitamin. And I think our patients, probably well over half, I would say in my practice, three quarters at least of my patients use some type of supplements and vitamins. So we see multivitamins, vitamin D, calcium, fish oil, vitamin C is probably the most common across the country and that's reflected in our practice as well. So how did this start with this craze about supplements? Well, historically, uh, and usually starting in the 18th century, people think that this started with scurvy. So sailors who were at sea for many, many months were developing a disease called scurvy where their teeth would start to bleed and fall out and their bones were very painful. And it took many years before people discovered that this was due to vitamin C deficiency and that replacing uh, this vitamin C deficiency with a citrus fruit or ultimately vitamins, and this was in the 19th and 20th century, uh, resulted in miracle improvements in, in people's scurvy. Uh, similarly, rickets was found to be due to vitamin D deficiency, and correcting the D deficiency corrected the rickets. So there was a real surge in interest in micronutrients and vitamins, which are substances that need to be ingested um, and have vital roles in the human body. And people started to say, well, maybe we should take it to the next step. If, if replacing these vitamins helps cure a disease, could we go further and take more vitamins and help prevent chronic disease and help promote longevity. So there was a lot of interest, but not a lot of science in taking vitamins and supplements to augment a diet um, and to see if people could find uh, ways to live longer and live better. Uh, in the 21st century, we find that the modern diet actually supplies necessary nutrients for virtually everybody. And it's not clear that we still need to be, take supplements, be taking supplements, minerals, or vitamins, and yet many, many people still do. So it was coined as hope in a bottle, and that hope that taking an additional substance in the interest of promoting health could indeed promote health. So that interest really outstripped the science, um, and, and we don't have a lot of science to support that. But I want to start with a poll. So Allie's going to launch a poll, and, and uh, we've got almost 75 people in the audience. I want you guys to vote um, and answer these questions. So Allie is going to launch a poll here. And it's pretty straightforward to do that. So the first question is, do you currently take supplements or vitamins on a regular basis? Yes or no? I'm going to give you about 20 more seconds. Awesome. Okay. All right. Great. Can you, can you display that, Ellie? So we've got 92% of you say yes and only 8% don't. So the 8% who don't take any supplements or vitamins, definitely in a clear majority, a minority. Okay, and then let's go to question number two. And question number two is, which of the following, um, Allie, I'm not seeing question number two yet, which of the following do you take? And you can choose um, more than one. So calcium, D, maltis, red yeast rice, vitamin B folate, CoQ10, or something else. And again, we'll give this about 15 seconds. Great, thank you. Oh, goodness, you guys are excellent, excellent participants. We've got almost everybody voting. All right. Ali, go ahead and share those results. So obviously there's no right or wrong answer, but vitamin D has got, in, got the most votes here. 84% of you take vitamin D. About half of you take calcium, multivitamins, B12, CoQ10, and something else. And red yeast rice, not too many, about 6%. Very interesting. Okay, 
perfect. And then there's the third question here is just going to be, be what's the main reason that you take these supplements or vitamins? Again, you can choose more than one. Um, did a doctor recommend it or a friend or family recommended it or you did your own research? And I know that from many of my patients, you bring in newsletters and websites and articles you've found that promote these vitamins and supplements. So historically, only about a quarter of people take supplements on their doctor's recommendations, and most people take it on their own recommendation. And here it's about half and half. Okay, perfect. So we're gonna share that. So about half and half doctor recommended it or you did your own research, and a few of you also had family family members or friends recommending it. Perfect, thank you. So we'll get rid of that poll. Okay, so today I'm gonna talk a little bit about vitamin D, calcium, omega-3 fatty acids, and red yeast rice. And then Dr. Kelly Hetchbeth is gonna talk about CoQ10, the folate and B vitamins, and vitamin C. We're obviously not covering all the supplements out there. There are many, many more. Uh, we just picked the ones that we see most commonly in our practice. So vitamin D, which happens to be the one that I think 84% of you are taking, and I'll tell you I take it myself, um, can be obtained from sunlight, from food, including food where it naturally occurs or food where it's fortified, and supplements. So sunlight, it comes from UV radiation, uh, UVB for the most part, and less so UVA. The problem is that if you look at the ultraviolet wavelength, the same wavelength that allows your skin to produce and convert vitamin D is the exact same wavelength that can contribute to aging of the skin and skin cancer. So most of us uh, don't spend a whole lot of time in the sun, and if we do, we're using sunscreen and we're covering up. So sunlight used to be a major source of vitamin D, and nowadays it is not so much. To get enough vitamin D, you'd have to spend about 15 minutes at midday in the Northern Hemisphere, hemisphere during summer months, um, about twice that if you have dark skin, because it takes longer to penetrate the melanin. Um, and you'd wanna do that every day uh, without sunscreen on and without covering up. So to have most of your body exposed for 10 to 15 minutes every day in the middle of the day. And most of us don't do that again, because of concerns about aging skin and skin cancer. So sunlight's no longer a great source of vitamin D for most of us. Foods that have naturally occurring vitamin D are egg yolks, salmon, some mushrooms. Not too many foods actually contain D though. Some foods are fortified, like milk has D added to it, but you'd have to drink about a gallon of milk every day to get enough vitamin D from your diet alone, or to have salmon once or twice every day. So most people, don't consume enough of those foods to get vitamin D entirely from their diet. Most people don't get enough from sunlight. And so a lot of people end up taking supplements, either because they had their level checked and it was low, or because somebody told them to do it, or they read about it and thought it was useful. Now, if we look at observational studies, which means we look at a population of people, and we measure their vitamin D, and we look at associations with diseases, we know that low vitamin D is associated with many, many diseases, including, as we know, an increased risk of osteoporosis and hip fracture, but also heart disease and congestive heart failure, stroke, diabetes, high blood pressure, dementia, falling down. Now we know also low vitamin D is strongly associated with increased risk of severe COVID, so the immune system. And when scientists look at vitamin D receptors, they're found on virtually every type of cell in our body. They're found in our blood vessels, they're found in our immune system cells, they're found in our bone cells. So vitamin D is an extremely important vitamin that, that a lot of people don't get enough of. Now, the problem is, if we see that low vitamin D is associated with those diseases, does it necessarily follow that taking vitamin D solves all those problems? That's the million dollar question. And unfortunately, not necessarily. So just to briefly review the pathway, diet, supplements, and sunlight produce vitamin D in the skin, convert it in the liver to 25 hydroxy vitamin D and convert it in the kidney to 125 dihydroxy vitamin D. And from there, it has actions on the skeleton, on the blood vessels, and on the heart. 
we know so much about bone health and vitamin D, and we know that 600 to 800 units of vitamin D per day recommending vitamin D3, which is the final step in that pathway, that's probably the healthiest way to get it, is what we need for bone health to achieve a level in the bloodstream of at least 25. So vitamin D for bone health, 600, 800 units a day, 25. But there's a lot of controversy about vitamin D that that level is not enough to protect against heart, health, heart disease um, and to help lower blood pressure, that the other effects of vitamin D on heart health maybe require more vitamin D than that. Unfortunately, there have been many randomized controlled trials in humans, meaning we take a thousand of you and we give you placebo, we take another thousand of you and give you vitamin D, and they have not been able to prove that giving vitamin D helps reduce the risk of a heart attack or stroke. So even though there's clearly an association out there, and even though in rodents and in test tubes, we can see that the vitamin D has a very important role in healthy blood vessels, healthy immune system, we can't prove that it actually reduces risk of heart attack or stroke. I'm gonna come back to D in a moment, but let's talk about calcium because D also helps regulate calcium. Now, any of you who have a diagnosis of osteopenia or osteoporosis have probably been told that you should increase your calcium intake. And the recommendation for bone health is 1,000 to 1,200 milligrams of calcium every day. And that can be from food and it can be from supplements. The problem is that when we give people these higher doses of calcium, used to be more 1,200, 1,800 milligrams a day, we saw that there was an increased association risk of cardiovascular disease risk. So CVD is cardiovascular disease, heart attack and stroke. Also an increased risk of kidney stones and increased risk of constipation, which can lead to colon polyps. So there's this mixed message out there about calcium, which is that it's really good for your bones and you should get more calcium, but you gotta watch out because it seems to also cause calcium deposits in the heart arteries, which can lead to heart attack, and calcium deposits in the neck arteries, which can lead to stroke. So when we talk about heart health, we don't recommend calcium to promote heart health, but obviously we're a whole body and we have to keep our bones healthy too, and we wanna keep the rest of our body healthy. So what's the right answer? Well, it's a little complicated and it's still evolving, but we know that low D is associated with this increased risk of heart attack and stroke, Adding supplemental D doesn't appear to lower that risk, but for bone health, probably the right answer is moderate amounts of calcium and D, when possible, obtained from dietary sources, particularly for calcium, so dairy products, nuts, green vegetables, weight-bearing exercise, which helps the heart health and the bone health, moderate sun exposure, and then if you have D deficiency or osteoporosis, meaning if you've had your level checked or if you have osteoporosis, then you should definitely take a vitamin D supplement at the very least for your bone health. And then there's some of us, including me, who believe that vitamin D is really healthy for immune health, heart health, blood vessel health, even though we haven't yet proven it. Now, there are ongoing studies, including one out of Harvard Medical School, to look at vitamin D, fish oil, and other aspects and other vitamins to see if they can ask, um, impact heart health that perhaps the studies that have been done to date have not been large enough and haven't gone on long enough to prove what a lot of us have a gut feeling is probably going to show that D is healthy. So in the meantime, I can't say that there's scientific evidence that we should all be taking D, but I can tell you that the, the basic science, the animal evidence, the test tube evidence would suggest that D deficiency is probably a very unhealthy thing. And I'll add that the people who tend to have D deficiency though, and this is where the, some of the controversy comes from, are people who are housebound, so they're not getting out and getting sun. People who have obesity because fat cells tend to store the D and don't release it into the bloodstream. People who smoke and older people. And some people who have malabsorption syndromes where they don't absorb the nutrients from their body. So people who have low D, perhaps it's not the D that's causing this increased risk. Perhaps it's the fact that they're elderly and housebound, living in a nursing home, smoking, carrying around more weight, and those are the things that are putting them at increased risk. So anyway, it's a little bit complicated. The science hasn't really caught up to the gut feelings yet, um, but 
When in doubt, you can always have your blood level checked for vitamin D. It's a simple blood test. And if it's low, especially if it's below 30, it's definitely a good idea and safe to take supplemental D. Okay, I'm gonna shift gears a little bit and talk about omega-3 fatty acids. So omega-3 fatty acids are EPA, eicosapentaic acid, and DHA, and these come from fatty fish. So mackerel, herring, tuna, salmon. You can also get alpha-linolenic acid, which is converted in the body to EPA and DHA from plant sources like flax seeds and walnuts, canola oil. Most of the studies have been done on EPA and DHA, and we presume that healthy people convert alpha-linolenic acid to EPA and DHA. So we lump all the plant sources together with the fish sources. Um, but that may be a leap of faith. So when in doubt, we generally recommend fish oil as a source of reliable EPA and DHA, unless you're a vegetarian, in which case it's probably just as good to get your alpha linolenic acid from flaxseed and walnuts. So another observational uh, study has shown that people who eat a lot of fish uh, have very low rates of heart disease and also healthier brains, lower risk of dementia, lower risk of Alzheimer's, Again, does it therefore follow that taking fish oil will help lower the rate of heart disease and help lower the rate of dementia? We know in test tubes that fish oil has anti-inflammatory effects. We've seen in some experiments that it can help stabilize heart rhythm. But again, unfortunately, the science has not borne out that taking fish oil supplements helps lower those risks. What do we know? The science shows for sure that high doses of fish oil, which would be four capsules a day of fish oil, four grams a day of EPA, DHA, lowers triglycerides. It doesn't really affect LDL cholesterol at all. So we don't use it to lower your total cholesterol or your bad cholesterol, the LDL. But we do use it in those people who have very high triglycerides, like over 200, 250. We know that giving fish oil versus a placebo to the general population does not lower risk of heart attack or stroke, except that if you break that down to look at people who don't eat fish at all, it does seem to lower risk in people who are at high risk and don't eat any fish. So again, even though many of us physicians have a gut feeling that eating fish is healthy and taking fish oil probably is the main component of what makes fish healthy, the science has not borne out that taking fish oil supplements lowers heart disease risk. Okay. I'm gonna stop with Reggie's rice and then I'm gonna pass on to Dr. Kelly Hedgebeth and we can take questions as we go and also at the end. I wanna say a little word about Reggie's rice because Reggie's rice has been used for centuries in traditional Chinese medicine for various reasons and used now for lowering cholesterol, especially in people who feel that they can't take a statin because of side effects like muscle aches. What's really interesting about Reggie's rice is that the active ingredient is the exact same identical ingredient in lovastatin, which is one of the statin drugs that we use prescription strength to lower cholesterol. So Reggie's rice does for sure lower LDL cholesterol because it is like a statin, except probably at a much lower dose. And because it's at a lower dose, it's not quite as effective as the statin. And also it seems to have a lower incidence of those muscle aches. So I have patients who can't take statins because of muscle aches and they take Reggie's rice instead and their cholesterol comes down a bit and their muscle aches really aren't a big problem. The problem is that a lot of people take it over the counter without supervision from a doctor and they're not getting their liver enzymes or their muscle enzymes checked and taken in higher doses, they can have, red uterus can have the same potential side effects as statins. So you gotta monitor the liver, you should monitor the muscle. You have to watch out for interactions with drugs that interact with statins like for example, grapefruit. So if someone eats more than a grapefruit every day or drinks more than a glass of grapefruit every day, just as we warn people who take statins not to do that, you shouldn't do that with red yeast rice. The other downside of red yeast rice versus a statin is that the amount of monocolon K or the effective ingredient pill to pill in the same bottle or bottle to bottle from the same company or different company, different company varies widely. So the problem with vitamins and supplements in general is they're not regulated by the Food and Drug Administration. So they can make claims on their advertising and they don't have to regulate the effective ingredient amounts in each bottle or each pill. 
So you could have one bottle where your dose is twice that of your next bottle, for example. So in general, with, with supplements and vitamins, because it's not regulated, you can have variable amount of the effective ingredient. There can be contaminants and unwanted uh, things included in it. So for example, some have gluten and you might be gluten intolerant, et cetera. And that's not just for red yeast rice, that's true of all vitamins and supplements. All right, so I'm gonna pause there. Um, Allison, is there anything we should answer now or do you wanna hold questions to the end? You're Sorry, right. I'm muted. Hi everyone. Um, We're out of getting rusty, yeah. I know, totally, yes. Well, it's nice to be back. Um, so there's no questions yet, but I, I think, you know, um, this is really interesting from my point of view because, you know, just preparing for this talk today, I'm sure you feel the same way. Like we are so blessed in cardiology that we have so much really fantastic data so that when we make recommendations to patients, we can really say, this is what we expect the outcome to be. And, uh, and, and really feel you know, that we're basing our recommendations on real truth. And yeah. you're talking about vitamins and supplements and just reviewing the quality of some of the data, it is so soft and so murky that um, even things that we take for granted, I think, are really, it's difficult to draw conclusions from. Yeah. So I, I just want to, yeah. you know, preface that. So thank you for those summary slides. I think especially everything that's been in the popular press recently with COVID in our immune function, that the vitamin D story is so interesting. So, so interesting. obviously, you know, when you and I are talking about things, we have the cardiovascular angle. And, you know, when we we're really looking at things usually through the lens of a cardiologist, but I think it raises a lot of interesting points, right? So do we really understand the dose of these vitamins needed for bone health? Do we really understand the dose needed for cardiovascular health? And you know, is there a different dose for your immune health, right? right. So there, there really right. is a lot of unknowns. Um, right, and the US RDA, so that recommended daily allowance is really quite arbitrary. If you look at how they, this committee sat down and came up with these numbers, it's sort of the amount needed to prevent these terrible diseases like scurvy and rickets, but is it really what's needed for optimal health? Yeah, and, and so, you know, now that I've, I've opened this box, I think it, it is worth saying a few words about um, how much vitamin D you need, and specifically in New England, because I think, as you know, as you said, um, it's really just impossible to convert enough vitamin D from the sunlight exposure, right? We, we really get two months out of the year that there's the opportunity, yeah. right? And, and, you know, most of the year, even if we're outside all day, we're never going to make enough vitamin D, right? So most people need to be taking a supplement and, and you might need more if you do have a darker skin tone, right? Because you're gonna really make zero from your environment. No, um, exactly. And, and, and people would estimate that you need about 2000 a day total from all those sources. So if you're getting some from the sun and some from your food, you know, maybe take a thousand a day, that's usually a safe bet. It's hard to get too much. And someone in the chat had said that her doctor had recommended a level of 60, is that dangerous? So we don't really see a signal of harm or danger till we get to 75 and above of vitamin D as a blood level. Um, and there's a, a signal of increased risk of pancreatic cancer or increased association, I should say, with pancreatic cancer. So probably true with everything. Too much of a good thing is not necessarily a better thing. But I tend to, to shoot for a level between 50 and 70. I think that's a good level in the bloodstream. And I think it's worth mentioning that, um, you know, first of all, there's a lot of this stuff that we're going with our gut, but we're not sure, right? So I think we're at the levels that are recommend, recommended are also different based on some of the subspecialties, which I didn't realize until I was reading up for this talk, right? So what the Endocrine Society thinks is different from the Internal Medicine Society, which is maybe different than how cardiologists have supplemented. Um, I will say that clinically, I have seen my patients that do have diabetes or that have high blood pressure, commonly I find... Uh-oh, you're freezing. Whoa. And that when we get that normalized, um, it's much easier to control blood sugar and blood pressure. Sorry, I don't know if it was just me, but you just froze, and I don't know if you froze for other people. Will you just repeat 
what what you like to get normalized? Sure. So when I checked vitamin D, I found a lot of levels that are super low. So um, yeah. and I agree that less than 20 is low. And so and when I get those levels normal, I have found that your blood sugar and your blood pressure is much easier. Yeah. To get. So I do think there's something going on with not only inflammatory pathways, but pathways looking at vascular tone regulation and how we handle blood sugar that vitamin D is really important. You know, it's so interesting, and I didn't mention this, but low vitamin D is also associated with a much higher risk of muscle aches in people who take statins. And a lot of people who've historically said, I can't take statins, my muscles hurt so much. We take a step back, we stop the statin, we put them on vitamin D for a couple of weeks, and then restart the statin and they can then tolerate it. But that's, that's very true across the board. If you can't take statins for muscle aches, you should have your D level checked. And I'm going to be talking about CoQ10 when we move on, which I think is really important also for that statin. Yeah. Um, to round this out, if, if you are experiencing muscle aches from statins, we always want to be uh, aware of what your thyroid function is and your vitamin D. So um, everybody should really be aware of that if you're on those medications. Um, yeah. The interesting thing out of COVID is that in these observational studies, again, not showing cause and effect, but just showing association, that group where your vitamin D level is less than 50 seems to be at much higher risk for being hospitalized um, uh, or you know, having you know, really sick illnesses or unfortunately passing away, right? So there probably is some signal with level. Um, we just don't know if, if supplementing and how we supplement can prevent that. So some yeah. of the treatments supplemented in this one-time mega dose um, have not seen the robust outcomes and smaller studies have shown that just increasing the regular daily dose um, yeah. might be a much better way to do that. But again, there's a, there's a big world that we're not certain about. So, um, so the, a lot to think about and a, and a lot to talk about. Um, I don't see any other questions on the, um, the vitamin D level. Um, yeah, so people can put questions in the chat, but also in the Q&A. But maybe, why don't you go on with your slides, and then we'll come back to all this at the end. That sounds good. Okay, so let me um, share my screen. Um, and while you're doing that, just you did break up for every, everybody. So the, the level of vitamin D that we aim for is typically 50 to 70. Um, and I'm going to put that in the chat. Great, and um, it says I'm logged on and secure. So um, if, if it happens again, I apologize and I'll just repeat um, what you've missed. So let's start talking about CoQ10 because in the cardiology world, this is a, a really common supplement. We didn't have that in the poll, but I think, um, or maybe we did have it in the poll. Did you ask this, Dara? Uh, yes, no, I, I don't think it was in there. Um, but uh, you know, many of my patients are on CoQ10 um, which we're going to talk about why, um, but if you're on a statin, it's really common to be taking the supplement. So this is the um, chemical formulation. It comes in, in three different forms. Um, typically, um, the uh, ubiquinone is the most common supplement. There are differences, um, genetic polymorphisms that are common in the population that may affect absorption. So if, um, if, we do check levels and we're not seeing a bump in your level. It might be that you have one of these polymorphisms. In that case, substituting uh, or supplementing with a different formulation might make sense for you. Um, but we don't routinely even think about any of this when we're talking about supplementation now. So again, this feels a little bit like the Wild West because we don't have a lot of data to, to back up these different forms presently. Um, oops. So um, CoQ10 is a cofactor that is important for generating energy in our cell. So this is a um, schematic of a mitochondria, which is the workhorse 
in the cell, right? So this is found in all the tiny cells in our body, but particularly those parts of our body that are really um, needing to generate energy, like our muscle cells or our heart, um, is where you might expect that CoQ10 is really important. So the bulk of the data we have is really related to muscle side effects, which a lot of times we see with statins, and also um, those in those patients that have heart failure um, affecting the, the, the cardiac muscle um, as well. So I reviewed some of this data and I'm trying to um, maybe uh, simplify this as much as possible with the caveat again that there is really nothing simple or straightforward when we're talking about these supplements. Um, Again, CoQ10 is a factor in all of our cells, um, and we are really hypothesizing that it would have the greatest impact in the heart and the muscle. Other organs like the pancreas, the kidney, and the liver also have um, high levels of CoQ10. So when you say the supplement, it's uh, absorbed through the small intestine, and then we see a steady state reached in the plasma, in the blood, and that's the level we check. Um, we hope that that translates to a steady state in the organ system, but that probably really takes weeks to months to have that happen. So, um, so being on a supplement for um, a, a longer period of time before you really draw conclusions is, is probably important. Um, the good news about CoQ10 is it is really widely used and generally really well tolerated. The most commonly, um, most common reported side effects are GI upset, followed by insomnia. And, you know, those are very subjective um, things. You know, obviously, if you're taking a supplement, you don't want to have any, but I think in general, this is um, regarded as a pretty safe supplement um, to be on. There are are potentials, however, for drug interactions. And this is where it's important because these supplements are not regulated the same way that we regulate um, medications, right? So there might be a lot of variations um, between company and company, but there is potential for interactions between CoQ10 and medications that lower your blood sugar. So um, those diabetic patients taking insulin, uh, might want to follow their blood sugar levels if they're starting CoQ10. There also is a small body of evidence that CoQ10 can actually lower your blood pressure. So the data there is um, pretty um, shallow in terms of seeing a robust response. But if you are somebody that's adding this supplement and you're already on blood pressure agents, you know, um, you might want to just make sure you're not having an interaction or finding that your blood pressure is running much lower with the CoQ10 in your diet. It also has the potential to interact with warfarin, which is a, um, a blood thinner, which we have to follow levels. So we might see um, a big change in, in whether you're therapeutic or not. So if you are on warfarin, obviously starting any supplement, you would want to make sure that your physician and anticoagulation team knows. Okay, so why do we care about CoQ10 and, um, and statins? Well, statins, um, block the pathway um, of cholesterol production in the body. And it turns out that's the same pathway that um, we make our CoQ10. So by taking this statin, you're blocking your internal production um, of CoQ10. Um, CoQ10 levels in our blood actually decline as we age. So um, I can't stop you from aging. So if we're adding a statin in addition to that, then we really see the potential for those levels um, to fall. Um, we have the ability to, um, to follow those levels. Although I will say from reading the literature, I don't know that supplementing to a specific level in your blood actually has bore out to translate into if you're hit this level, you won't have any side effects. I think it's much more complicated than that. Um, but the bulk of the data I do have is in that subgroup of people that are on a statin that have experienced muscle pain, muscle fatigue, or muscle weakness. And we kind of clump all those people together into one group, uh, what we can abbreviate as SAMs or statin-associated muscle symptoms. So this is a really busy slide. Um, and 
partly I want to show it to you to show you the, the, the raw data, but also to illustrate just the complexity. So this is data from a meta-analysis. And what a meta-analysis does is it takes all these little trials that have tried different small doses of CoQ10 in a group and may or may not have shown um, an impact and kind of blends them together to see if we can draw some conclusions by increasing the number of participants included in this trial. So you can see here that it does appear that when we um, do this meta-analysis and marry together some of um, these smaller trials, that we really do see a benefit in CoQ10 in reducing muscle pain within those patients on statins reporting muscle pain with reducing muscle weakness, again, in those patients on a statin reporting muscle weakness, and a little more borderline for those reporting cramps and muscle tiredness. So, this is fairly robust da data saying CoQ10 is safe, and if you're experiencing muscle symptoms, there's probably some benefit, which is great news. So we, um, I think in cardiology, are, pr are, are pretty routinely using CoQ10 in those patients that have muscle symptoms. The dose studied is typically 200 or 400 milligrams a day. Taking doses smaller than that may or may not have an effect. And typically, you know, the same as, as Dara said, when we supplement with vitamin D, we really want to reach a steady state before we reintroduce the statin. The same idea is with the CoQ10. We would really want to build that up for several weeks or maybe even longer um, to see an increase in the CoQ10 in the actual muscle, you know, before expecting to have um, any benefit from that. Um, there is some data for other things besides skeletal muscle, um, but that data is much less robust, as I said. So the, the role of CoQ10 for high blood pressure or for heart failure is, um, is less clear. Um, since you know this is a cardiology lecture and we're talking about cardiovascular health, even though I don't have great data for heart failure, I did want to to share some data with you because I do think the downside is pretty minimal besides the cost of the CoQ10 um, in, in terms of adding that to your regimen. So um, the, the data for heart failure has really looked at those patients that are the most sick and have recurrent symptoms or, or in and out of the hospital, right? So these aren't patients that have a diagnosis and that are doing well. Um, not all studies have shown a clear benefit, but one of the more recent trials that was a larger trial that studied um, a little over 400 patients um, did show some positive findings, which I think is still, you know, suggesting there could be a benefit is certainly not part of the heart failure regimen, but I think it is interesting. So for the heart failure data, Usually these studies look at higher doses than we use for um, when we're treating statin muscle pain. Um, typically 100 milligrams taken um, three times a day or sometimes even 200 milligrams taken three times a day is the dose studied. Um, and in this one trial, they looked at those patients with heart failure who got readmitted to the hospital um, and how they did on a six minute walk test and, and there did seem to be a benefit. So. Um, while it's not a first line agent, I think if, if patients aren't doing well and they're not maybe tolerating some of their other medications for heart failure, um, there's probably little harm in adding this and maybe some benefit. Um, so I say that with a, with a caveat. Um, so I don't know if we have any questions for CoQ10. Um, otherwise, I'll just keep going. Can you, so someone was asking how we can measure the level of CoQ10, and I think that's just done in research, right? We really don't measure it. So you can measure the plasma level through send out labs. It's not routinely done. Um, in um, my panel that I have set up with um, Boston Heart, which is some of my patients are on, um, we do some metabolic and advanced lipid profiling, and it can be included in that, but it's not routinely done through, um, through the Brigham at this time. Okay. Okay, um, so I'll keep moving on then because I did want to talk about the B vitamins. Um, so this is a schematic of all the B vitamins, which um, you know are found in um, plants and some of them a lot in animal sources. So um, B6 um, is found um, in 
a lot in salmon and also in poultry. And then B12 is also found in animal sources. Um, these B vitamins are grouped together a lot when we talk about cardiovascular health. And there is some promising data that supplements um, might be beneficial. Um, it's, again, not straightforward. And when we're talking about B vitamins, um, to mention homocysteine. So homocysteine is a metabolite that's found in cellular processes. Did I freeze again? My apologies. A metabolite found in cellular processes and um, it has a potential role in the propagation of cardiovascular disease. So we see evidence of it when we look in the vasculature um, at um, cardiovascular plaques where there's um, these really lipid thick foam cells where there's inflammation going on and also evidence of kind of that fat buildup in the, in the vascular wall. Um, homocysteine potentially affects how soft and relaxed our blood vessels are or how stiff um, they are and also can affect um, the clotting cascade. So in, potentially important for cardiovascular health. And I show that just because when um, we're talking about homocysteine, um, and, and this is you know, a busy slide, but this is an important cellular process. And to shuttle back from these amino acids, cysteine and methionine, you kind of have to go through homocysteine. And so this pathway goes back and forth. And lo and behold, here are the B6, B12, and folate, um, the B vitamins are really, you know, propagating this pathway um, both ways. So um, when we talk about you know, supplements of, of B6, B12, and folate, we're really linking it to hyperhomocysteine, right? So we have seen that these high levels of homocysteine might be more apparent in um, vegetarians, and that's because they have lower B6 and B12 in their diet. Certainly is associated with malnutrition, which sometimes we see with um, alcoholism. There's other medical conditions um, like pernicious an anemia where we have um, impaired absorption that we see this. And then those patients with chronic liver and kidney disease, sometimes with autoimmune diseases as well. And then there also are some genetic variations in that enzyme also regulating that pathway. So a number of different reasons that we might see homocysteine elevated. Um, but when we supplement with folate B6 and B12, um, the, the trials individually have been very mixed. Some have been positive, some have been negative. Overall, looking at all-cause cardiovascular disease, there's not a clear benefit. When you tease out just the stroke, and that's what's shown here, it does look in this meta-analysis that there is a benefit overall um, with adding folate B6 and B12. Um, again, this is not straightforward, but I think is really interesting for us to talk about, especially, um, you know, if, if we can make maybe some personal recommendations and not be um, trying to jump in, in, in supplement for everybody, but, you know, um, specifically for our patients at the highest cardiovascular risk, there might be a benefit here. Um, when we look at just the folate alone, the data is a little more mixed, okay? And I don't wanna make this lecture um, too technical, but I also don't wanna oversell the, um, uh, the importance of folate um, or the importance of really just um, being uh, critical of the literature when we go through it. So this is an, another um, forest plot, a meta-analysis, looking at the incidence of stroke with just supplementing with folate. And so the take home here would be, oh, there's a benefit of folate alone. But there's a big caveat because this, this data here is really driven by this one large um, trial, which um, had over 10,000 patients, which I think everybody can see from this forest plot here, right, that it's really this, this diamond that's in the um, significant phase is, is really driven by this blue square, which is this one trial. And so the difference in China is that um, folate is not supplemented in their diet as it is in the U.S. So folate is a B vitamin that 
um, is critical um, for pregnant women in preventing neural tube defects in our offspring. So in the US, we supplement our cereals and our flour with folate. In China, they don't. Um, and so in this one study where um, homocysteine levels are very high and folate is low, you see this robust reduction in stroke. But I think we're not seeing that extrapolate to the US population where we have much more folate in our average diet. So my conclusions from reviewing this literature is that the benefit for stroke reduction from the B vitamins um, include taking folate, B6, and B12, and that the reduction that we see is really um, hinged on the homocysteine level. Okay, so even though there isn't a clear benefit or reduction in having a heart attack by homocysteine, it does seem um, that probably there's good data to for stroke prevention, especially if the homocysteine is elevated. And then the type of um, folate that we supplement um, is sometimes easier um, or, or, or sometimes uh, if it's methylated, bypasses some of the genetic abnormalities that we see in our population. So it is recommended to choose a methylfolate. And then it's also recommended that we choose a methylated B12 because B12 can actually be toxic at high doses, especially if your kidneys are not normal. So, um, so I tried to summarize a very technical aspect of this and I hope that that makes sense to people. Um, any questions coming in? Um the methylated type is something that you just buy in the drugstore. You just have to look for methylated. Yeah, you just read the ingredients and it'll have a methyl in front of the, the type of the B12 or the B6. Okay, and there's another question which is, it applies to CoQ10, but also really to everything, which is are we dosing based on body weight? Should we dose more for someone who weighs more, less for someone who's small? So uh, great question, and I definitely do not have the answer to that. I can tell you that the doses that we routinely use um, for the muscle symptoms um, is much less than what's been studied in heart failure. And there um, is this body of evidence in neuromuscular diseases that have looked at CoQ10, and they supplement at much higher doses as well. And I am not as familiar with that literature. So I think it's really hard to make a blanket statement about that. Yeah, but I think, those yeah. are all you know, great question. Should we be doing that? And, and does it matter? You know, probably yes, but, but we don't have a lot of data to guide us. Um, I think, you know, if you look at pharmacology, some vitamins and supplements are fat soluble and stored in fat. Others are water soluble and excreted every day. And so it really, there's a lot of things that determine how much of a medicine or a vitamin or a supplement one should take. Warfarin, Coumadin, for example, you can have a little tiny person who requires tons of it because they metabolize it so much more quickly than a larger person. So it's not always as simple as weight-based. Um, sometimes it has to do with um, fat percentage, blood volume, kidney function, liver function, et cetera. So very good question. And I think jury's out on that. Okay. Sorry, keep going if you want to. Continue. Okay, sure. Um, so I just had a couple more slides. Um, Oops, we'll, we'll leave um, the B vitamins and move on to vitamin C. So the data for vitamin C is not that robust. I think um, I wanted to comment on it though, because you know I grew up taking vitamin C. I think a lot of people add it to you know, their daily supplements. And for cardiovascular disease, we just don't have that, that much data saying that it's clearly beneficial for your heart. Um, it is a potent antioxidant, and so I think everybody feels that it is important in immune function. Um, some of the trials have looked at um, upper, upper respiratory tract infections, especially in kids, and I think they're, that's probably where the most robust data is that vit um, vitamin C might be beneficial. Um, the other um, issue with vitamin C is it does seem that the um, ability to absorb um, or uh, uh, reach certain levels with oral absorption is very different than the levels you can reach with IV vitamin C. So there is some data in the cancer literature um, that you know supplementation with IV vitamin C might be beneficial, especially 
if you're undergoing chemotherapy. I'm not going to talk too much about that just because that's really out of you know our expertise. So sticking with cardiovascular disease, I just want to show you some of the, the data from a recent meta-analysis that again takes these smaller trials, you know, and and tries to really choose trials that can be married together and then look at them critically. Um, and there's we're we're just not seeing um, a, a really clear benefit from the cardiovascular aspect with supplementing vitamin C. Um, oops, okay. Um, so those I think are the end of my slides. Let me stop sharing. Um, All right, then I'm just gonna wrap up with my little summary slides here. And, oops, sorry, I need to scoot forward. Okay, thank you. So just to summarize that as a general statement on vitamins and supplements, there's lots of observational studies that have shown that people who take vitamins and supplements live longer, live healthier, but there are not a lot of randomized data to show that taking those vitamins and supplements is what is the cause of the longer, healthier life. So for example, people who take multivitamins tend to also not smoke and exercise and eat a healthy diet and see their doctors regularly. So is it the multivitamin that makes people live longer or is it just the fact that people who take vitamins tend to be healthier? And I would say that most of the data would suggest that there's certainly a role for the fact that this is a bias of selecting people who are healthier. And you could look at our patients, and I think our patients take a lot of vitamins and supplements and tend to live much longer than the general population. And I'm not sure we can all take credit for it, but healthier people tend to see their doctors and take these supplements. For now, what we do know for sure is that for the general healthy population, it's very safe and very effective to get your nutrients, your vitamins through a healthy diet. And the Mediterranean largely plant-based diet has certainly been shown in multiple studies to reduce risk of stroke, heart attack, cancer, and death in general. And the exceptions would include people who have restricted diets or are taking certain medications or have certain increased nutrient needs. So people who are pregnant, people who have malabsorption problems or bariatric surgery, people with macular degeneration, vegans or other restricted diets, osteoporosis, people who take proton pump inhibitors like omeprazole, Prilosec, Nexium, tend not to absorb the B vitamins and calcium as well. And older adults in general may benefit as well. So from certain vitamins like B12, D, and calcium. And you know, a final statement is that if you do decide to take supplements, please discuss it with your physician because there's certainly uh, interactions with other drugs that can make supplements unhealthy. So just because something is natural doesn't necessarily mean it's safe. It may be, and it may be great, but anything that exerts an effect on your body, whether you got it at CVS through a prescription or you bought it over the counter, it exerts an effect on your body that may be what you intend and may be things you don't intend. So remember that the FDA doesn't regulate the safety, effectiveness, cannot regulate contaminants, and they're constantly pulling things off the shelves and off the market when they find contaminants or dangerous side effects, but they can't keep up with all the things that are currently showing up on, this, on the shelves. And the advertising budgets and the things that people can claim are really not regulated at all. Um, so again, drug interactions, if you are gonna take a supplement, there are certain independent verifying companies like the USP, uh, the pharmaceutical industry that can verify that there are a few contaminants and that it contains what it says it does. So look for a USP verified or another type of verified like consumer lab. And in general, you don't want to exceed the US recommended daily allowance for what a vitamin uh, is, should be. And a couple really good websites here, uh, and we'll send these slides out to people. Uh, Drugs.com, you can look for interactions. So you go on that website and you write interaction checker and you can look for interactions with your drugs and your vitamins. Um, and WebMD.com, it tends to be an excellent website as well. Uh, the National Institutes on Health has an office of dietary supplements that has some really good information. And the Harvard Medical School Health Letter, which is free, 
um, has lots of different topics, health topics that Dr. Kelly Hedgepeth and I have contributed to this over the last couple of years, and they do a lot on supplements as well. So I'm going to stop sharing, and I think we have a few more questions. So please feel free to put your questions in the Q&A. Um, and can you tell us, Allison, is there a type of CoQ10 that you particularly recommend? So um, I have recommended a brand Jaro, um, J-A-R-R-O-W, which I think is just a brand that's well vetted. Um, and I've come across independent sites that, you know, have said it's, it has what it says it has in it and it's a good source. Um, I, I think it's, it's really um, difficult to vet some of these um, supplement companies. Um, I don't know what your approach is, um, Dara. Yeah, no, I think there are a couple really good companies that um, are very good. Nature Made is a good one. Thorn is a good one. Um, if you look at like the Consumer Reports or other independent websites that don't take advertising, they have independently reviewed the most reliable ones. Most of them are made in the US or mostly made in the US where it's more closely regulated. Each, each vitamin is a little bit different. So for CoQ10, that's Jero. And for others, um, I'm going to put down here Thorn, uh, Nature Made is a, a easy to find one as well. Uh, Kirkland brand, which is a Costco brand, uh, is also very well regulated. Um, gosh, we're running out of time and there's a bunch of questions that have come up. Oh, so when you guys put things in the chat, I just want you to know that the, we can see it, but the other audience members can't. So someone put in consumerlabs.com, which is a subscription service that tests supplements. So that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, and now I don't know what now is. Um, but let me see if there's a couple more questions, maybe broad questions before we wrap up. And one is hypothyroidism. I don't know if, if that was something that was tying into a few of the topics we talked about earlier, but is there anything that you want to add about hypothyroidism when it comes to supplements and vitamins? Well, I think, you know, thyroid function is really critical to your metabolism. So that's something that, you know, routinely is checked. And sometimes patients are, are just not aware their doctor is checking it. But certainly if you um, are on a medication for your cholesterol, you have to be normal thyroid. So that's something we routinely check. And then if you're having side effects from any cholesterol treatment, that should also be repeated. Yeah, great. Oops, I'm trying to, somebody wanted to see that websites again, so I'm just trying to put them back. There we go, okay, perfect. All right, great. I, I think, sorry that we did not get to finish all of these. Um, but we should wrap up. And it was such a pleasure to see everybody back again. We had almost 100 people by the end there. And we really appreciate everybody's interaction and throwing the questions and, and the answers in and sharing that with everyone. So please, when you get, you're going to get after this email, you'll get the, we'll send out the websites. Um, Allie, if you can send out the websites with the email with the questionnaire. So uh, give us your feedback. Give us new ideas for webinars. We're going to start a whole new season of webinars again starting uh, as the summer wraps up. And next week, please join us for Dr. Laura Frain talking about the aging brain. She's, she's wonderful and she is going to help us talk about what's normal aging, what's not normal, and when to worry. So thank you all so much. Thanks, Dr. Kelly Hedfeth, and thanks to Ali LeBlanc, our behind the scenes assistant here. Um, and thanks to all of you for coming. Great to be here this week. See everyone next week.